Dr. Lou Loomis, and Thinking Well, empowering people and communities for 50 years. Before this profound and fulfilling period of her life, Lou Loomis, a native New Yorker, had already earned a bachelor's degree, the first woman in her family to do so, had married her husband and life mate of 65 years, Worth Loomis, had lived abroad in Turkey with him for two years, had started raising their family of five kids in Cleveland, Ohio, had contributed to the U.S. Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s, and had figured out how to balance a professional life with her personal life. These life experiences were the essential building blocks of what would come next. People call me Lou or Louise. Children often call me Dr. Lou. Uh, and my full name is Louise Earl Loomis, Earl being my maiden name. And I was first a science teacher. When I started to go into education, it was science that I was teaching. Uh, and I started teaching uh, at a junior high school, as they were called then, uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. So when we moved to Hartford, I was very much interested in teaching in Hartford. I had been also very interested in urban education when I was in Cleveland, and I brought that interest with me uh, into Hartford. Uh, so I think that led quite naturally into getting my first teaching position, uh, which was at Weaver High School. It was when I first started at Weaver uh, teaching the thinking skills. I've, I've told her the story about the boy in the back of my room. I did teach a class in thinking at Weaver High School. I also taught science, introductory physical science, which is fabulous, but of course. Uh, and so I was doing a few little exercises in the class. And I put up a Y. We were doing exercises where you had a shape and then people made something out of the shape. So I put up a Y and then invited kids to come up and draw what they had drawn. Okay, using the Y, had embedded it in a picture. So this young man who was always sat in the back row and didn't look like he was, you know, wanted to be there and so forth and so on. So I came up and he turned and the, oh, and you had to make the, the shape had to go with a word that we were studying. And the word was Jeopardy, not the show, but the word Jeopardy. So he came up and he turned the Y on its side and he put a car on each of the arms of the Y as they were heading towards the middle. And I thought that was fantastic in my book. And this was this guy who was, you know, Mr. <laughs> Non-Participant, <laughs> yeah. So that taught me a lot. And then I remember uh, doing a workshop at a school in the south end of Hartford and teaching metaphors there. And there was one young woman who just adored the metaphors. She couldn't get over how excited she was about understanding what a metaphor was. You know? In the Higher Horizons cluster, um, back at early, my early years at Weaver with her and the Higher Horizons team, she started off as kind of a mentor, but kind of a, she was the senior member of the team as you know in the sense of years of experience in teaching and I was probably the least experienced as far as teaching I think it was been my, my that would have been like my fifth year or sixth year in in, in in education so I guess she realized I was I mean I was enthusiastic about what I did but she also knew that I was young and, and kind of green as far as you know the lay of the land and what to do with the young people and because of my role as a reading teacher for the other teachers, 
she encouraged me to not just provide skills for reading for the young people, but to branch out and maybe take on whatever they were, whatever the students were doing in the English class, the social studies class, the science class, which was hers, or um, math. I would dovetail their lessons and amplify what they were doing. So they were actually getting a double dose of everything. She encouraged that and it really worked out well. And that's what led us to when we were looking at the kinds of work we were giving young people and what the responses were, it turned out that they were, I mean, they were pretty good kids. They were marginal good kids, but most of them ended up being valedictorians and salutatorians and high ranking honors kids. But they weren't really engaged in what they were supposed to be learning. And through her finding out this program of think, the thinking skills program, she saw that it would help me. So that was her mentorship kind of like dragging me. Not, I, I wasn't kicking and screaming, but it was, it was exciting because it, it, gave, it gave me more tools for my toolbox but it also helped the young people grasp whatever I was doing. So for example, for English, if, I were, if they were doing something um, with their English teacher, I might be doing great expectations along with them, but giving it my spin as far as the, the reading skills involved in it and the thinking skills involved in it. So they were, rich, they were enriched by my work with them in my room and incorporated what we learned about this cognitive six, which we're calling it, the thick six thinking skills, we, we incorporated into our classroom work because I was still working with her at the time. And lo and behold, these things actually worked and they actually helped bring young people from just rote memory, regurgitation kind of things into actually thinking about certain things and actually putting labels and being able to know the process of what the thinking order is. What hasn't she been involved in? Oh, the Artist Collective, very, very, very influential and very, very um, instrumental in uh, working with Dolly and Jackie. In fact, when, as far as the McLeans for the Artist Collective, when we were in Higher Horizons together at Weaver, Jackie McLean would come in and lecture every year to our young people. I mean, I, I mean, I didn't know him, know him. I just knew who he was as a, a great jazz saxophonist. And he would come in and Jackie would be like, just, he would mesmerize the young people with his, because we would have full, full house assemblies. And he would just mesmerize the young people with his stories, with his instruction about how to um, navigate life and to avoid the pitfalls that he may have um, fallen into through his lifetime and career. And then little by little I realized, oh, that's not just Jackie McLean, that's the artist collective Jackie McLean. And I was introduced to Dolly, his wife, and Melanie, and the, the young, the, 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 and their, Renee and their children, and um, became more in tune with what the artist collective could provide our community. Not knowing that Louise was on the board of directors, so that worked out very well until my youngest child went off to, to college. Uh, and at that point, I became interested, had become interested not in, in science, but now in teaching thinking and thinking skills and so forth, until I, my interest in this creativity uh, led me back. And I got my doctorate in 1994. It took me eight years. <laughs> Uh, Tom and I first met uh, when we were both teachers at Weaver High School in a program called Higher Horizons. Uh, and uh, we hit it off, I think, just practically immediately. We both were interested in the whole area of teaching people how to think and uh, had taken training from a woman named Judy Kovacs. Uh, and The Cognitive Six is the book that Tom and I have come up with, but it's based really on the original work. The cognitive six are basically ways to encapsulate the major hierarchy of thinking that happens in all of us. It's just... Uh, so what are the six? What's the first one on the list? Uh, naming and thing making. Naming and thing making, yeah. Uh, now naming is perfectly easy, right? That's verbal. 
What do you suppose thing making is? <laughs> well, of course. That, uh, however, cognitively, what's thing making? What would you say thing making is if it's not uh, the verbal aspect of uh, what you're learning? Yeah, when you get an idea, uh, when you conceptualize something, when you have an aha, uh, all those types of things are thing making. In our office, we have a series of cards hanging on a string, and the title is called Train of Thought, and it has a little choo-choo train. And it has the six thinking skills all on it as the train of thought. Uh, and that's designed, of course, for anybody, but we use it in the classroom as something that's of constant reference. But when I'm in the classroom, I'll say, like, let's name some things or, or qualify them or, and use those, use those terms so the children get the idea that they have different ways of thinking, at least I hope they do, and that they can actually name them. I was first working with it and doing, were able to do some workshops. There was some funding at that time uh, in Hartford. I really was taken by how these techniques produced work from children who weren't necessarily the stars in the class. That other children began to appear uh, uh, as, uh, as productive. You know, that really got to me, <laughs> right? This book, Nimble, Nimble Thinking, uh, that's based on uh, Anita Harnack, Harnadex rules for good critical thinking. Uh, and that's another aspect that we also like to promote. In fact, we don't remember, right? All right, divergent means this, right? Convergent means this, okay? So if I'm doing this kind of thinking, do it with your hand. This kind of thinking, what is that kind of thinking? Open-minded, Open -minded, looking for many possibilities, okay? Now I'm tired, I've got too many ideas. Come on guys, let's get going. Let's get the project underway. So we need to what? If converge, right? Let's pick so over the, the list that we've created. And what are we going to do with that list? What are we going to use from that list? That's convergent, OK? Now, there are different stages in, in your academics when you have to do one or the other, correct? OK, so if I have to learn a lot of factual information that I need to use, which kind of thinking is engaging in that when I have to do that kind of thinking? Is that divergent or is it convergent? Divergent. And you have to speak up even when I have hearing aids on. Divergent. If I have to decide? Divergent. Convergent. All right. You gotta, I got to decide what I'm going to do with all this mess up here in the front of the room. OK. So that's convergent. All righty. Now, if I'm open-minded to new ideas and look, am I going to solve the problem? What kind of thinking is that? Divergent. Divergent. Okay, so you ever go back to your room after a full day of classes and so forth, and you realize you've got to study. What's the process then that you've got to undergo if you're going to study something? You've had this, you've had that, you've had that. Now I got to do what? Do I have to diverge and come up with some more ideas? All right, say it. Yeah, I have to converge on one thing or the other, okay? One of the ones uh, that really gets into the people's systems is know when you need more information. And um, I have a nice anecdote I think you'll like about that. So we talked about that. How do you know when you need more information? Well, you might feel stupid. Alrighty, you might be confu feel confused. Uh, you might uh, be reading something and, and, and not quite getting it. So, I'm nothing the matter with me except I need more information. 
Yeah. So, um, did you know that a metaphor uh, can be reduced to, to a um, mathematical equation? I didn't know what? about that. All right. So, we, we, we see, um, it's if we say variety is the spice of life. That's all right, so. So, you're saying that variety here equals spice, aren't you? Okay, so what is it uh, that goes under spice? If I have variety is the spice of life, I have variety is to life as spice is to what? To food. Good. So I have variety is to life as spice is to food. What's the connection? What is it that variety does to life that spice does to food? It flavors it. Flavors, what do you mean by that? Um, it, it, uh, it flavors it. It provides um, a, an, an, a delightful experience. All right, so variety provides a, a delightful experience to life as spice provides a delightful experience to food. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I've set up a mathematical equation, haven't I? Yeah. So all metaphors can be transformed in that way. Dr. Louise Loomis teaches people how to think and teaches them how their brains work. And when you understand how your brain works, when you understand how your mind thinks, you can be more effective, you can be more creative, you can be more powerful, you can make a bigger difference in the world. I know that what Dr. Louise Loomis does for me personally is she helps me think about how do I have the greatest impact? How do I use the resources at my disposal to make the biggest difference in students' lives? Those tools are tools that everyone can benefit from, and in fact, I think I have benefited from and the students I touch have definitely benefited from. A brief explanation of Dr. Liu's CPS technique. There are two key components to creative problem solving. The first is divergent thinking, generating lots of ideas and options. The second is convergent thinking, evaluating options and making decisions. Each of us engages naturally in both divergent and convergent thinking. The key to creative problem solving is to mindfully separate divergent thinking from convergent thinking. To do this, you need to generate a lot of ideas before you start to evaluate. This 20 minute creative problem solving process was developed by Dr. Louise Earl Loomis, the founder of the Thinkwell Center in Hartford, Connecticut. Over the years, Dr. Liu, as she is known, has facilitated creative problem solving and critical thinking programs for individuals, groups, businesses, and students. As a result of this extensive experience, Dr. Liu distilled the longer creative problem solving process into this simple four-step, 20-minute process. Dr. Liu is a master at meeting her students where they are. Her positive and encouraging approach is structured, but not overburdened by structure. She also encourages participants to ask for more information when it is needed. And participants gauge their own reactions, including noting what's new to them and considering how they can use it in their daily lives. I belong to a committee that Don Hamer kind of put together about, you know, he felt the need to have more going on at the church, uh, and particularly in some kind of an outreach kind of educational program. And we had a kind of a discernment committee uh, out of which came the idea of having some kind of a school. Uh, and uh, so we started up with the school, and the first person that we employed as a director of the school help get the school started. It started as a school for, for middle school, teen, for teenagers. Uh, <clears throat> and two things occurred during that early uh, year and the year and a half. 
Uh, one, one was that the person that, that we uh, hired who, who moved here from New York City uh, was less adequate than we had hoped. And the second one was that uh, we had a kind of a, a, a second assessment with a, with a colleague friend who was already involved with the other successful school covenant, uh, who was very helpful with us and helping us discern really what population to work with. Uh, and out of that came the decision to work with, uh, with the elementary school level and become in somewhat a feeder to covenant and ultimately to race, to grace, not, although not all of our students go to those schools. I am Don Hamer. I am rector at Trinity Episcopal Church and along with Lou, one of the co-founders of Trinity Academy. Lou and Worth um, have been members of Trinity Church for many years, I think actually since they arrived in Hartford. And um, uh, I knew of Lou's interest in education and her passion for um, you know, the study of the mind and, and that. Um, and also she and Worth are uh, incredible um, uh, community donors. Uh, they just... Uh, we're involved in so many community activities and, and, and so concerned with the life of the community. And then we received an invitation to attend a meeting down at Virginia Seminary. It was a one-day meeting to look at, um, it was sponsored by the National Association of Episcopal Schools, and they were looking at creating a specialized subsection of NAES that would cater to urban schools. But a very productive day because we became one of the founding members of the uh, Episcopal Urban Schools Alliance, which is about 14 or 15 schools within NAES that caters to urban populations. We kind of dropped the idea of, of ruining a good choir school to try to create a day school and started with the idea of a standalone day school. My name is Jennifer Scanzano. I'm the head of school here at Trinity Academy. Trinity Academy is an independent school, tuition free for boys and girls, grades one through four. The success of Trinity Academy is really because of what Dr. Liu has done for everyone involved. Sometimes you can become complacent. Dr. Liu will never let anyone become complacent. Absolutely no one can become complacent. There is always something that she will challenge you with, something she will help you with. Um, you know, her focus is the brain and, and definitely how that works and how that grows. And um, she's turned me into an outside of the box thinker, which I think I maybe wasn't before I came here. Dr. Liu devotes a lot of time to Trinity Academy. She comes in, she works with our third grade class, but she also devotes time to some of our other students who are in need of enrichment. Um, it's a passion of hers. She loves doing it. The students love working with her. They generally work one-on-one. -on -one. They work in small groups. And she devotes about an hour each week to working with this stu these students and really challenging them. Hands-on equations. Algebra for elementary school. What does the two next to the X mean over in the first Example. So it means two X's. X's. Yeah, yeah. And I've had people who've put that up as a number two with an X next to it. And then when you point that out, they say, oh, and then they understand algebra from then on. It's really very interesting. Okay, so, interesting. so if you let's set it up and, and solve it. Oh boy, what's this two doing there? 
What's the two doing there? X plus, oh. That's right, it means two of the blue. You got it? Mm -hmm. Okay, here's your pad. Oh. Okay, so I'm gonna set it up. Okay, so let's start setting it up. All right, you set it, wait right till Anna has it set up. Set it up. Seeing analogies, one of the cognitive six thinking skills. I'm Jaylene, I am 10 years old and I am in fourth grade at Trinity Academy. Dr. Liu in third grade, she came every Friday for, to like teach us about her train of thought and we every day we will learn something new from her train. And one time she read us a book that she had made that we enjoyed and it was she made multiple books, but that book we read and it was good. And one time we did an experiment where she put, an, put paper in a bottle and put an egg on top and we saw how it sinked in even though the egg was too big for the bottle to go through. And her projects that she does with every day we all enjoy and we always learn new things on those days. Fun. She's really, she's really fun. And sometimes she makes us laugh. She's really, she's actually really amazing. She's probably one of the best um, teachers that I've had. I can't really describe her because she's almost everything that anybody can think of. World maps, maps for all in elementary school. And everybody find out where the United States is. Yes, yes, let me see you show me, yes, okay. Great, so everybody's sure where we are. Okay, now can we find on this great big map, because the letters are so terribly small, which part of the map do we live on? When you're looking at the map, is it on the left side or the right side? Who's ready? and to write one of the two things you found, because I think otherwise it would take too much time. Who, who's ready to come up and write one name down? Eku, come on up. Yes, how's this one, pretty good? Um, I think the, the other black one is better, actually. Oh. Yeah. Oh, Kadogs, who's ready? Eku is coming up. All right. Uh, Take your map if you need help. Yeah. We could have two people writing at the same <coughs> time, couldn't okay. we? Johnny, why don't you go up and write your, your place too? You want me to hold that for you? Good for you. We come to school to learn and to remember, right? So that's why at the end we want to find out <laughs> if anything stuck during the class, right? Okay, so we heard from a few of you. Uh, about uh, what went on in class, and so we expect that. Well, have a good weekend, everybody. And see you next week. And 
Yeah. And thank you, class. Dr. Liu's 90th birthday celebration by Trinity Academy. I'm going to show my children. <laughs> Dr. Liu is loving, lovely, radioactive, lasting, lively, lucky, likable, leader, lovable, listener, good, and emotional. Yes, wow. Also, Dr. Liu is unique, <coughs> unclassable, oh, sorry. Uh, um, Dr. Liu is outstanding, organic, Original, outrageous, optimistic, objective, organized, and outgoing. Dr. Liu is unique, unbreakable, unforgettable, unbeatable, understanding, unsubstantiated, and undeniable. I'm so glad you put that organized because if you saw my desk today, you might not have put that on. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Liu, so much for waiting. My name is Candida Flores. I'm the Executive Director of Family Life Education, which is a middle-sized uh, nonprofit organization operating in Hartford for 32 years. I have been with the organization for 10 years. The um, organization serves mostly women and children, helping them become self-efficacious. That's our new service approach that I developed about 10 years ago where they unveil their potential. Uh, all of us have the ability to control our lives and our destinies. I met Dr. Loomis when we moved the organization to a building next to where she has the Thinkwell Center. When we uh, met, we found that we're very aligned in our thinking in terms of how to support the community to overcome challenges. Um, I learned that she was uh, dedicated uh, all her life to working with children, helping children um, overcome cognitive uh, challenges, and that she was an educator for many, many years. So as we talked about the work that we both did, we connected immediately. And so that's what we work with them on, helping them understand that they have the capacity to overcome challenges and to become self-efficacious, to learn how to problem solve mostly women uh, and children and because our focus is so strong on children so Lou and I became very good friends and she again worked very closely with us and our staff when the center was um, conceptualized um, everybody agreed that naming the center after Lou Loomis was the right thing to do she was the right person. Wellness Center is going to be a place that her legacy will go on. Everything that she has taught and continues to teach will continue through this Children's Wellness Center. For me, having this happen was something that I truly looked forward to because now that we have the Children's Wellness Center, there's so much more that we can do. We have this 
huge space that we can incorporate a lot of the um, practices that we learned through Lou's whole model of cognition and thinking about thinking and, and, and helping to empower parents to learn that they have this magnificent brain that provides them this opportunity to think beyond what they're thinking of. Much of her, her ideas, um, their environment is going to be set up so that everything that we are talking about in terms of how children are learning and what's happening when children are doing and, and, and when children are engaged in experiences that they are really doing a lot of problem solving is really what Louise Loomis has taught and it's what she continues to teach. <laughs> What does that mean? What is a healthy baby? What is a happy baby? A happy baby is a baby who's healthy in all areas of development. A healthy baby is, is, is a baby who is going to learn to make healthy choices. A healthy baby, a happy baby is a baby who is going to be able to problem solve. A happy baby is a healthy baby who when he or she fails, he or she knows that they can get back up and start over again and never give up. And in one of the programs, I showed a world map, on which I wish, as, as it turned out, I wish I'd done it sooner. Uh, because the first thing that happened when I brought them over to look at the map was one woman cried. She'd never seen a map of the world before. She had no idea what it looked like. Uh, and another woman, pointed at Israel and she said, why is it so small? It's in the news all the time. So this connection with size and power, I, thought, I think is very interesting that seems to be inherent in, in us. During the process of, of uh, being at uh, the Thinkwell Center, I became interested in maps. I had been interested in maps earlier because I had had, while I was teaching, a student write USA on the USSR because it was the largest country in the, in the, in the, uh, in the world. Uh, and so that interest stayed with me and I started the Maps for All program, which is still running to get world maps in public places. So. Well, we have a really good committee of people who come from different walks of life who are interested in, in Maps for All and understand the benefits of greater understanding of geography. So what would be really cool is if when you walked into a restaurant or you walked into a library or you walked into any public place, there was a map on the wall. And it could be the, the kind of map that we used to get from AAA years ago that showed you exactly where to head but it could also be an artist's conception of a map. It could be something interesting and intriguing and engaging. It could be a multimedia map. But all of that builds to increase awareness. Um, so what would I think be fun and interesting and educational, all of those things, is maps for all. Uh, everywhere you go, there's a map and you can engage in, in the map in different ways. Uh, it's really engaging in geography. The, the map is the, is the vehicle to understand the geography and the implications of that to uh, people's lives and our own. Um, I know Louise Lumen from all of my time at the World Bank. She has always been a great supporter and friend of everything that we do. Louise currently serves on, on our board of directors as well as runs an initiative out of the World Affairs Council um, that's called Maps for All and is focused on geographical literacy for the community hoping to educate everybody um, and have everybody understand their place. And I think the legacy that Louise will leave um, is going to be illustrated all over her story, not only with our initiatives in geographical literacy, but the legacy she le leaves with critical thinking, um, especially with our youth reaching out to our future generations. That impact will be multiplied um, forever. We are launching a really exciting initiative today with some wonderful partners. 
um, and we're happy that you can be here with us to uh, to witness this and, and to be part of it um, on our first day. And we're so thankful and grateful to Dr. Loomis for inviting us to participate in this initiative because it is such a natural partnership uh, between us and uh, the Mass Royal Initiative and UConn and the World Affairs Council to, to come together in this way and to promote something that's so important to all of us and particularly us here at the library, which is literacy. And when you think about literacy, you certainly think about reading, right? And that's the first thing that comes to mind, and that's obviously a big part of what we do. Um, but literacy is broader. We take a much broader ap approach to the thought of literacy as a, as a learning environment and as a goal to ensure that people are literate in all sorts of skills, and that includes reading, but it also includes cultural literacy. It also includes you know, numerical literacy, health literacy, all the kinds of things that we think about as, as learning opportunities. And the one that we're here today to promote, obviously, is geographic literacy and world literacy and the way that all of those go together. Appreciate it. thought you might like to know how all of this happened. Uh, and it goes back quite a, quite a long time. Uh, to go back to the mid-'80s, uh, and I'm a teacher of critical thinking at Weaver High School. Uh, and uh, one day I bring out some world blank world maps uh, for the young people, the young men and women, uh, to start filling them in. Uh, and I notice, uh, to my somewhat dismay, that a young lady has placed USA over the USSR. Uh, now, this is in the mid-'80s when we were in the Cold War. And so I uh, asked her, I said, you know, I, I put it over here. How can you put it there? And she said, well, it's the largest country in the world. And I've had subsequent experiences after that with other situations uh, in which people associated size with power. Uh, oh, a small country, why is it in the news all the time? Uh, a little boy trying to find Jamaica. Uh, on the world map and saying, oh, it's so small. Uh, so that got me interested, and I started talking with people about, uh, about world maps and about uh, geographic illiteracy. And incidentally, I started including teaching world maps, uh, political world maps, in all my critical thinking classes at Weaver and then subsequently uh, at the Hartford College uh, for Women. When I retired, I was still thinking and talking about uh, world maps and public places. And so uh, after several groups of people that we got together and chatted and so forth and so on, uh, in 2012, excuse me, we started uh, our own Maps for All initiative. Really, uh, we're so delighted to be here today and to have Maps for All as one of our initiatives. Um, if you come to our office, and you're all welcome to, you will uh, notice that we love maps. Anyone who works in our office, comes to office, has to have their own map. Um, so uh, our interns who are here with us today, the first day that they're there, the first thing that they do is get their own map. And, and those maps are provided by Bill, who's here, um, and a set of pins. And they are you know, instructed to pin every place they've been in the world. So anyone walking around our office gets a sense of your place in the world. Uh, maps for All has been providing maps for our program. And I will give you an example. Last night, we hosted Ambassador Robert Ford, who was the most recent United States ambassador to Syria. And Maps for All, for All provided some maps. And so when he began to talk about the extent of the refugee crisis in all of the countries that the, that the refugees are fleeing to, to be able to have a map in hand and at the podium to uh, identify and get a sense of what he was talking about was invaluable. In an era where we're looking at users that are overloaded with information, and in an era where everybody can pull a map out of their pocket uh, with a smartphone, we're actually faced with an interesting challenge. And it is that people are losing the ability to truly read maps in the way that we've become accustomed to it and understanding the context of geospatial uh, relationships between places. So the Maps for All initiative is really to help us develop the context that we've all been missing in the digital era, to bring us back to understanding the relationship between places and spaces. 
I'm excited to be part of this library partnership with the Hartford Public Library, and particularly uh, some of the services that we're going to be developing in the coming months here, uh, one of which will be cartography and uh, data visualization services so that we can take the ability to, to help users both at UConn as well as the public uh, to take and visualize their ideas on maps and also to use maps in storytelling. So proclamation by the Honorable Luke Bronin, Mayor. Whereas Maps for All is an initiative originated by Louise Loomis, founder of Thinkwell Center, LLC, to support the World Affairs Council's campaign to promote greater knowledge and understanding of international affairs, and whereas to display world maps and other geographic representations in public places with the intent to increase awareness, and whereas to provide area to provide area continent and world maps for programs and projects, and whereas to offer instruction and programs to develop connections between maps, and whereas Hartford Public Library in its downtown and neighborhood branches will serve as a vital contributor in this necessary initiative that supports our global community, and whereas the city of Hartford stands proudly as a sanctuary city, resolved I, Luke Bronin, by the authority vested in me by the laws of the city of Hartford, do hereby proclaim March 1st, 2017 as Maps for All Awareness Day. It is a rare experience to hear and learn the impact you've had on another person's life. And it is even more gratifying to hear from those people about that impact in your own lifetime. It is through the making of this documentary that your children are moved to witness firsthand how their mother has changed so many people's lives for the better. They are inspired by the variety of ways she worked to follow her calling of empowering people of all ages to embrace what we all have in common, the power of our brains. And it is through this understanding of how we think and use our brains that gives us the ability to change and make a difference in ourselves and others. Meeting her for 10 years has significantly changed my life uh, and the way I think in many ways. To be with her makes me, makes me, when I sit with her, I feel more intelligent afterwards. <laughs> makes me feel very good about myself being there. She really got me to think. You know, she would always come in and say this phrase, we're gonna be thinking about thinking and understanding how much power we have because of this amazing brain that we have to change the course of our decisions, the course of our lives. I guess the best way to describe this, she sees potential. She sees potential in people, certainly in education and students. She sees potential in what we can know and what our capacities are. And she sees potential in projects and has come up with a lot of really interesting projects. Dr. Louise Loomis has helped me in three very distinct ways. The first one is that she challenged me to understand how my own brain works, and then once I knew how my own brain worked, to bring that to today's students that I work with at the University of Hartford. The second way that Dr. Louise Loomis has helped me or impacted my life is that she has come into my sessions with my students at the University of Hartford she has challenged them, she has sparked their ideas, she has basically challenged their creativity and helped them become more creative. The third way that Dr. Louise Loomis has changed my life is that she made me realize that there is so much more to the way we think than what most of us take for granted. Knowing how you think, knowing how to maximize your mind, knowing how to push yourself beyond your comfort zone 
are skills that every one of us can benefit from, and I most certainly have. She just gets things done. She's an amazing, um, accomplished, smart, wholesome, well-rounded, cultured. She's just kind of a little bit of everything, a full package of a person. She has been a guide in my teaching career so far. I kind of came into this not really knowing what I was doing, um, and she has been there through the five years, acting as a mentor, acting as somebody I can always go to, um, and just somebody I really respect uh, and, and value her ideas very much. Dr. Liu, thank you from the bottom of my heart, I think from the bottom of Trinity Academy's heart for everything that you've done for the school. For me, you have made me a better person, you have made me a better educator, um, and you have definitely made me, I think, really just a better friend because of what you have done for everyone involved, the community of Hartford, the community of Trinity Academy. We are forever grateful for your love and support. Deeply related to her God, not in a wear it on your sleeve way, but in a, in a way that um, makes you understand she knows who she is. Uh, and um, and how the work she's doing in the world relates to her faith and, and her creator uh, and her church. But it's an arts night or a science night or whatever. We have virtually 100% participation um, of the families uh, who are excited to see how their children are learning and they're invited into that process of, of sharing and, and educating their children. Um, you know, public schools and most private schools would be delighted to have that kind of participation rate. Um, and all that I really attribute to Lou's leadership and her in, in, in inspiration. Um, the way she lives her life, the way she um, gives of herself, um, uh, and the way she invites others along for the ride. Louise's impact on is it's hard to measure but it's easy to see and not to be oxymoronic it's just that from the people that have I've met that are part of her circle there's something that happens where she she makes you think and then she and then she, because you but by making you think you also become more, um, more at ease with your intellect. She makes it possible for you to realize that you are smart. And, and it's comforting. And it sort of makes you sit back. You know, you're able to relax and not feel that, um, you're the world's biggest dummy. There's just something that she does where she affirms your intellect and she affirms your being through your intellect and just through, just through being in her presence that you become someone who wants to go out and change the world or just change a little bit of the world or just change yourself or just, cha just do something. So you, you become active rather than passive. Lou remembers vividly that moment of inspiration, her spark that never left her. She was a typical teenager, hanging out in her living room after school in her family's New York City apartment. My nephew, little Roy Jr., yes. So um, when his mother died, he was a little infant, so he really, he really never, never knew her. Uh, and his father was uh, an Englishman born in India, and he was in the OSS. He was really snapped up by the OSS. Uh, so my mother became a grandparent raising grandchildren. And years later, I was very active in the similar program here in Hartford, so it's interesting uh, <clears throat> that I'd had that, <clears throat> that early experience. 
and I became <clears throat> very close to my niece, who was only 10 years, 10 years younger than me, and then her little brother, Roy. So one day, Roy was sitting uh, in the little, <clears throat> the little library in our apartment in New York City, and he was playing with some toys and trying to put them together, and he was, at that age, not verbal. <clears throat> <clears throat> Uh, you know, in the sense that he could say a few words, but you couldn't have a conversation with him. Uh, and so I wondered if he was thinking, you see. And so I noticed that he had some problem with some blocks, and he finally put them together <clears throat> into what was a little car or truck, and he was able to uh, roll it along on the floor. And so I remember that years later when I got involved in teaching thinking, you know, that I had had that interest uh, at that early age and then how it reemerged as a later part of my uh, educational work. This 15 minute tutorial video on Dr. Liu's creative problem solving technique is an example of the original vision for all of this video content created by the Thinkwell Center and Don Pacini Productions. This CPS video is hosted on the Thinkwell Center website and is being used by Amy Barzak, Executive Director of the Women's Advancement Initiative at the University of Hartford, as independent study and is also linked from the University of Hartford website in the 2020 W Magazine, Giving Back, Redefining the Art of Thinking, story about Louise. Welcome to 20 Minute Creative Problem Solving. In this program, you will learn how to use and facilitate the 20 minute version of the creative problem solving process that was developed by Dr. Louise Earl Loomis. If you Google creative problem solving, you will find evidence of many variations, all of which can be traced back to the work that was started by Alex Osborne in the 1940s and further developed by Osborne and Sidney Parnes in the 1950s. Osborne not only founded the Creative Education Foundation, which held its first conference at what is now University of Buffalo, but also invented brainstorming and co-founded the advertising firm, BBDO. His classic book, Applied Imagination, continues to inspire the work of the Creative Education Foundation. The diversity of approaches to the creative problem solving process and its current widespread use are testimony to its power. There are two key components to creative problem solving. The first is divergent thinking, generating lots of ideas and options. The second is convergent thinking, evaluating options and making decisions. Each of us engages naturally in both divergent and convergent thinking. The key to creative problem solving is to mindfully separate divergent thinking from convergent thinking. To do this, you need to generate a lot of ideas before you start to evaluate. This 20 minute creative problem solving process was developed by Dr. Louise Earl Loomis, the founder of the Thinkwell Center in Hartford, Connecticut. Over the years, Dr. Liu, as she is known, has facilitated creative problem solving and critical thinking programs for individuals, groups, businesses, and students. As a result of this extensive experience, Dr. Liu distilled the longer creative problem solving process into this simple four-step, 20-minute process. Dr. Liu is a master at meeting her students where they are. Her positive and encouraging approach is structured, but not overburdened by structure. She also encourages participants to ask for more information when it is needed. And participants gauge their own reactions, including noting what's new to them and considering how they can use it in their daily lives. There will be times when knowing how to facilitate 20 minute creative problem solving, known as CPS for short, will be helpful. So let's start with an overview of instructions for facilitators. When you are facilitating 20 minute CPS, you will want to have one or more teams of at least three people per team. 
If you are doing this for larger groups, divide the group up into teams of three or more people. In each team, one person is the problem owner, the person whose problem will be solved. The other two or more people serve as consultants to each problem owner. The problem owner or owners describe the situation and their consultants use divergent thinking to come up with creative ideas. Then they use convergent thinking to evaluate ideas and start planning to solve the problem. The objective is to generate at least two potentially useful solutions. As Dr. Liu says, the 20 minute creative problem solving process is an organized way to work with the natural disorderly functions of the mind. The 20 minute CPS process includes clearly defined roles and steps. This 20 minute creative problem solving process worksheet can be downloaded from this PowerPoint. It is recommended that this one page CPS worksheet be given to participants when you are facilitating 20 minute CPS sessions. The objective of this 20 minute CPS process is to generate at least two potentially useful solutions to each problem owner's problem using the four step CPS process. Each step is allowed only five minutes. It is recommended to set a timer for each of the four steps. Step one, name the problem. Step two, clarify and define the causes of the problem. Step three, brainstorm ideas to solve the problem using two different types of brainstorming. The first is initial brainstorming. The second is the scamper brainstorming method, which we will learn more about in just a minute. Step four, evaluate and plan to solve the problem. After this, the problem owner can take action. In step one, naming the problem, each problem owner speaks to their consultants for five minutes about their problem. Direct the consultants to listen carefully. They may not speak or ask questions, but taking notes is recommended. Taking notes on easel pad paper that is visible to all on the team is ideal. The problem owner continues to talk but must stop immediately when the five minutes are up. It is helpful to invite the problem owner to consider the following when they are describing the problem, as well as anything else they think would be helpful to the process. What, who, when, why, how? What led up to the problem? What is the sequence of events? What are the consequences? How do or did you feel? And how do you think the other people feel or felt? In the second five minute period, clarifying and defining the problem, consultants ask questions to get more information to help their understanding of the problem. Problem owners respond, answering the questions and adding information that will help clarify and define the problem. The facilitator directs the problem owners and consultants to consider the following and anything else they may want to explore. What I really want in this situation is, was this problem unique or is it part of a pattern? Has it occurred before? How have you or others reacted before? What have you done in the past about this problem? How has it worked out? There are two parts to step three, brainstorming, where the problem owner and consultants brainstorm together to generate ideas for solving the problem. Allow five minutes for both. Set the timer initially for two minutes. Step 3A, initial brainstorming. Have one consultant record the ideas for the problem owner. Writing these ideas on easel pad paper that is posted on the wall is recommended. Go for a large quantity of ideas. Invite everyone to be wild and free. Do not worry about quality yet. Do not discuss or judge as you go along. Just keep being fluent and get lots of ideas out. In step 3B, invite teams to use the SCAMPER process. The acronym SCAMPER was developed by Robert Eberly and published in the book Games for Imagination Development. SCAMPER is part of a larger model containing two other sets of attributes for being creative and problem solving. The first is being flexible, fluent, original, and elaborative 
in Thinking by Ellis Paul Torrance. The second is possessing curiosity, courage, risk-taking, being intuitive, and preferring complexity. SCAMPER stands for seven activities that can assist idea generation. To use the SCAMPER method, the problem owner and consultants take another look at the ideas generated by their team so far and see what they come up with when they consider the following. Substitute, combine, adapt, maximize or minimize, put to other uses, eliminate, reverse or rearrange. Set the timer for three minutes for this step. In the last five minute period, evaluate and plan to solve the problem. Each problem owner selects two or three alternatives that she or he is interested in trying. All members of each team work together to refine the ideas. After the 20 minute creative problem solving process is completed, each problem owner outlines their potential plan of action and they commit to trying to refine the solution or solutions and to take action. It is helpful for problem owners to put deadlines on the plan of action and set up a system to report back to their consultants. The next step then is to take action. The ThinkWell Center offered a style of training which included experiential, interactive, and multi-sensory elements. Learning was always based on an active process of discovery. For trainers and educators, ThinkWell Center specialized in workshops that used thinking skill formats for all of its programs. At ThinkWell Center, professionals, students, adults, older adults, and everyone in between were invited to think about thinking, think clearly, think things through, think well inside and outside the box, think on the spot, and think big. Some of the languages spoken at the ThinkWell Center included critical and creative thinking, creative problem solving, or CPS, convergent and divergent thinking, 21st century learning skills, essential questions, teaching for understanding, project-based learning, depth of knowledge, and SPUNKY. SPUNKY stands for surprising, puzzling, useful, new, knew it already, and interesting. In all programs developed by the ThinkWell Center, participants gained confidence in what their minds could do by understanding the brain's natural gift for organizing information, recognizing when they NMI needed more information and how to ask for it, spotting fallacies that confused their thinking, and mastering methods to boost their memory. Testimonials from past program participants. Marilyn Rossetti, executive director of the Open Hearth Association said, I had the distinct pleasure and great luck to take a class from Dr. Loomis. Her teachings were invaluable and I have used them many times over the years. Dr. Lou is patient yet firm. You will not be disappointed in any work you do with her. I truly believe that where I am today in life and in my career, I owe in part to her teachings. The staff of the Brain Injury Association of Connecticut said, what a wonderful thought provoking presentation. It was especially fun that it was interactive. Another person from the Brain Injury Association said, thank you for your thoughtful and insightful presentation. And a third person said it was very meaningful and enjoyable. 